Richard authored his uh, deconstruction of the therapeutic prison in Canada. And as it happened, his forewarnings could not have been more prophetic. This, uh, for, if you'll excuse the hyperbole, this forensic juggernaut that Richard heralded did indeed set sail through the 1970s and certainly uh, in increasing fashion in subsequent decades. Psychiatrists and increasingly psychologists and various other allied side professionals um, penetrated the prison environment in droves and they imported with them an arsenal of normalizing technologies that would have even impressed Foucault. But as Lacombe and Bonnie Castle and Hannah Moffat and Kilty have all documented in the Canadian context, to describe these programs and these practices as therapeutic in any conventionally understood sense would be to you know, totally misconstrue their principal function their principal function as tactics and strategies of governance. If the experts were reprogramming criminals, they were doing so within this hybridized paradigm that I'm referring to of mental administration that was increasingly aimed at, what? Calibrating and containing risk. It was aimed at arranging subjects within grids of deviant probabilities. It was aimed at converting psychiatrically unwell offenders, as however unwell gets defined, into categorically labeled and pharmacologically regulated self-monitoring ciphers. I mean, these would be people who were becoming kind of prototypically kind of responsibilized and re-responsibilized neoliberal prisoner citizens. And that was, that was the project. Um, as Danny and others can attest, that project didn't necessarily unfold as its uh, original programmers would have uh, preferred. But I think as, as Richard understood, um, probably better than anyone at that time particularly, and even as we projected into the present tense, medical power in prison, to quote Joe Sim, as, as medical power in life, was predicated in large part on this spectacular, breathtaking capacity of professed experts to internalize the discourses and the mandates of their adopted milieu, and they are extraordinarily adaptable, to serve up the vocabularies and narratives of therapeutic motive which legitimize punishment in disguise, to uh, quote Kelly's work, and contradictorily, and this is where I'll hand it over to Dorothy, all the while to concoct this kind of endless supply of seemingly original theories and technologies and promises in this ongoing effort to underscore their autonomy and their indispensability to the system. And there is the contradiction that uh, we'll speak to as this uh, paper unfolds and concludes. Dorothy. Okay, so in the next section of the paper, we, we take up Richard's professional tinker's metaphor, uh, which he drew from Goffman, uh, and use it as a point of entry into the themes and preoccupations that have framed our own engagement with psi power over the years. And uh, that has focused particularly on charting the gendered construction of mad women through the rhetoric, theory, and practice of mental health knowledge makers and administrators past and present. Uh, so we're informed by now a generation of feminist writing on gender madness, criminal, criminality, and law, and referencing uh, case histories, which are drawn from our collaborative research. And we argue that the substance and format of expert knowledge systems and transactions in areas or arenas of mental governance as elsewhere are intensely aligned with empowered relations of gender as much as they are reflexively implicated with social class, race, sexuality, disability, generation, and assorted other dimensions of dominance, subordination, symbolic violence, and alterity. Um, so we were lucky uh, to be able to access two very rich data sources uh, and to you know, do, do research and analysis and, and write up our findings and so on and so forth. And I'm going to talk about one of them. Um, which comes from the former Metropolitan Toronto Forensic Service, which was known as Metforce and which was established in the late 70s um, in the old Queen Street uh, Mental Hospital uh, in, in Toronto. Um, what happened was that through the um, auspices of uh, 
uh, Chris Webster, uh, who was a research scientist at Metfors. Uh, we managed to get access to the clinical files and follow-up hospital and criminal records of 600 forensic patients who had been subject to multidisciplinary psi assessment following their arrest, usually, uh, but in sometimes, uh, some cases, their conviction in the city of Toronto. Um, so one of us, Bob, um, wrote, actually wrote his doctoral thesis and later a book uh, on the experiences and implications of a psycholegal assessment process through which moral and political decision making got systematically rebranded into presumptively scientific accounts, which cemented the dangerous identities of patient prisoners and bolstered the punitive capacities of the criminal justice system and thereby the state. And unsurprisingly, uh, Richard was the supervisor and the inspiration for those projects. Meanwhile, getting back to us, we were becoming increasingly, increasingly intrigued by the gender dimensions of psycholegal classification and governance in criminal and penal contexts. So what we ended up doing um, in terms of our collaborative research was pull out the exhaustive clinical files on the first 57 women to have been psychiatrically profiled at the Met Force brief assessment unit, as it was known, during the late 70s. And we coupled that, sound, that those 57 women with a match sample of men that were pulled from the, you know, the, six, the remainder of the 600 cases that we had access to. Uh, and we started to delve into the ways that tinkering practices were getting applied to doubly deviant women who were criminal defendants and convicted offenders suspected of mental aberration. So this and other studies actually based on the Metfors data revealed you know, lots of things, but I'll just you know, focus on a couple here. Um, our studies revealed how police and forensic decision makers and judges we're beginning to emphasize sameness, responsibility, and formal equality as neoliberalism took shape in the late 20th century. This pervasive move towards a responsibilizing, de-individualizing risk management paradigm in the criminal justice and mental health systems as elsewhere carried far-reaching implications for the routine encounters taking place between experts and their women subjects in liminal psycholegal contexts like metaphors. So on the one hand, gender was unquestionably a powerful and sometimes even determinative force in shaping the tenor of expert judgments at this forensic agency. Clinical knowledge workers arrived at their decisions via ideological and normative routes that were in every sense intensely gendered. And of course, this apply, gender applies to men, the men too. Um, but male normativity, chivalry, hyperpathologization, and patriarchal framings of women's sanity, docility, and domesticity were all to be found in abundance in the professional stylings of these expert assessors. And interestingly, and but probably we were dealing with different uh, populations, but in contrast to Hilary Allen's work, uh, which she published in Gender Unbalanced uh, in 1987, the gender attributions at Metfors were mediated, in other words, it wasn't just gender, mediated in complex ways by the social class identities and other markers of alterity and danger that both women and men carried with them in relatively equivalent measure into this mental classification plant. So whatever the states of mentality they beheld in their patient defendants, the clinicians considered most of the women and the men they assessed to be thoroughly accountable for their crimes. So for both men and women, madness was seldom brandished as a mitigating factor. Indeed, a psychiatric diagnosis often amplified the intensity and scope of psycholegal censure, paving the way for penal sanctions which were nested in and justified by a blended amalgam of pathologization and accountability. So both women and men were found guilty of floating conventional standards of femininity and masculinity respectively, and these standards were deeply immersed in legal, or at least quasi-legal, ideology and discourse. These people's alleged offenses ascribed mental states and moral violations translated into an emphasis on criminalization more so than medicalization in the psi classifiers' reports. And we really see this retrospectively. We didn't see it so much um, at the time. And the consequence was that these forensic prescriptions uh, 
found a receptive audience among judicial decision makers who were interested less in the arcane workings of their subjects' mentalities or in their gender identities than with finding concrete solutions along with attendant vocabularies of legitimation for the sanctioning problems that they were facing daily. Um, all of which um, brings us back uh, to Richard's Tinker's Paradise and, and to the present tense. So what we're going to <clears throat> do now, I'll start and Bob will finish, is just uh, give you an extended postscript uh, and reflect on a couple of uh, points that we think are important. Uh, the first one um, relates to differences and continuities in psycholegal governance. Um, there's a tendency to do the hydraulic, uh, you know, these sudden qualitative shifts that change everything, right? Um, uh, and, and that, or, and, and at the same time to accentuate the continuities, uh, you know, that the more things change, the more things remain the same in psycholegal governance um, as elsewhere. Um, but since the time of Richard's article, needless to say, um, the 2010s are not the 1970s. Not, we're not in the context that Bob just described a couple of minutes ago. Um, so for one thing, um, the climate of critical scholarship and activism which colored that earlier golden era of psychopolitics fell distressingly into abeyance during the latter two decades of the 20th century to the point where, as Richard Bental recently observed, the very term anti-psychiatry descended to the level of a common pejorative. Um, and of course, for its part, the biogenetic paradigm of mental illness, uh, which Bob talked about earlier, also went, underwent a remarkable renaissance through those same years. Um, and what might at first seem an awkward alignment between biomedical models of madness, neoconservative moral ordering, and neoliberal politics, on closer scrutiny resolves into a powerful and far-reaching symbiosis. Um, just as the nation-building and citizenship projects of a century ago offered fertile soil for the germination of eugenics theory and somatic psychiatry, so too has neoliberalism with its sponsorship of unbridled entrepreneurialism, its vast deregulating and globalizing forces, its constitution of the shallow consumer citizen and its promotion of technical over cultural solutions to human problems mapped itself indelibly onto the new post-therapeutic biogenetic psychiatry. So as we see it in, in the present tense, under neoliberalism, biology has become the defining technology and overarching metaphor for knowing and containing the psychiatrized other. Only through the applications of biogenetic medicine argue its exponents can the diseased mind-brain be engaged and return to nominal working order. Moreover, the expert knowledge systems and transactions that neoliberalism fosters are intensely aligned with gendered power relations as much as they are reflexively implicated with assorted, those other sorted, uh, assorted dimensions of dominance, subordination, and so on. So marginalized on multiple fronts, somatic, socioeconomic, moral, and political, the mentally ill subject has forfeited her entitlement to participate in her treatment or in her life, other than as a passive and dependent carrier of compromised chromosomes or tarnished tissue or dopamine and serotonin systems run amok. One's brain scan and blood serum re results for all intents and purposes become one's identity. And to chemically or electrically tinker with the damaged parts is to offer all that can be done by way of management. There is no question of restoring the brain disabled subject to a state of fully active citizenship. But happily, the story does not end there. And I'll let you tell, let Bob tell the rest of it. In the two or three minutes I have remaining, if, I have, if I'm reading the clock correctly, Janet, um, I'm going to try to lift you out of this depression. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> I, we do want to kind of underscore at the very conclusion of this paper that um, you know, this, this assemblage of neoliberal biopsychiatric systems and discourses and practices that we've just kind of woven together here 
has still been showing its vulnerabilities to the world, and we'd argue far more so in the course of the past uh, decade. Um, and we are beginning to witness some very interesting, intriguing cracks in this kind of biogenetic paradigm. Um, Richard recurrently observed throughout his career that, um, you know, in, 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 I think it was one of the leitmotifs of, of his work, the contradictions in the structures of authority abound and the resistance is endemic in this, you know, the center that he, you know, so um, energetically and eloquently described in so many spheres of life uh, seldom holds. Uh, Yeats was right. Um, now, as we move into this 20th century, we're bearing witness, we'd argue, to um, what can only be described as a spectacular kind of revitalization of critical scholarship and human rights contestation of biopsychiatry. Um, increasingly, observers have been exposing these very precarious systems of thought and the research methods and what we would characterize as the blatant self-interest upon which this edifice has, uh, has been built. And I don't have time to talk about DSM, which I would in a better world. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the psychopharmaceutical industry, but suffice to say, I think those are two kind of centers of gravity that are attracting dissent and dialogue. And certainly, if we have time uh, after the paper, we could, could have enter into uh, that discussion. I don't have time to speak to the, the range of um, critical organizations and, and initiatives um, that are surfacing worldwide um, to um, defend human rights of psychiatrized people. And I don't have time to speak to the, you know, the extraordinary initiatives that are um, being um, organized, um, again worldwide on a global scale by psychiatric survivors themselves, uh, nor the, you know, the, the theories and practices of feminist therapy and the recovery movement, which is enormously important, liberatory psychiatry, post-psychiatry, members of the MAD movement, uh, all of whom are in, uh, implicated in, in developing a kind of a wide galaxy of creative alternatives to biogenetic psychiatry and in response to human distress and, and euphoria. Um, so in encapsulated form, just to say that for all of the reversals of the past generation, and you know, notwithstanding uh, what we're describing here is the entrenchment of neoliberalism and the corrosive and reductionist brands of mental health ideology uh, that it's wrought. In some respects, you know, we're as optimistic as we have ever been. And, you know, much of our writing, certainly, um, which uh, Dorothy described in, 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 in partial aspect, uh, on the lives and institutional experiences of marginalized and out with, to quote Pat Carl, out with women, to retain their identity and their sanity and their voice amid the institutional madness that surrounded them, um, is, is kind of focusing on, on this, this the, the kind of the power of, of people to prevail under these circumstances. So, you know, we draw that inspiration from um, these histories and we draw that inspiration as well from the survivors and activists who continue to resist and, and transcend. Um, now, just to conclude, um, I don't think either of us could claim with any confidence that Richard would entirely share the hopeful tone of these final few words. Um, but we do like to believe that he would have recognized the influence that he had, and it was an immense influence, to, <laughs> to be sure, on the, on the critique of psych-knowledge psych work that we bring to the paper and have been bringing to our work for the better part of three decades. And we have no doubt that he would have uh, smiled knowingly at the undying hubris shown by the professional, the professional tinkers of his 1970s commentary and of the, uh, by the professional tinkers of the present day. And at the prospect of their being hoist by the very petard of scientific claims making, which has yielded so much of their institutional and cult cultural influence. So as you know, Richard's students, and there are a number of us in the room, as we mentioned yesterday, we learned much about the capacity of uh, academic criticism to unsettle the powerful, to render transparent their discourses and deeds, and to hold authorities and their projects accountable to the standards of integrity and social justice that he brought to all of his writing. I think that would be an appropriate place to pause, to conclude entirely.
So we'd like to answer a few questions, but if you'd like to sit here or whatever. Where do you want to be? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Aaron? So, so I think things like that are really this really interesting overview, and I, I'm sort of throwing this back at you partly to give you a bit more time to talk about what you were talking about at the end, but um, I'm teaching a course in social movements this term, and one question we often ask is, you know, why, the sort of the why now question, why, why movements flourish at a particular time, and I just wanted you to speculate a bit about why there's been this mm -hmm. revitalization at, and why now? Yeah. Over there or? Yeah, you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a question that people in the MAD movement have been asking you know, over the, the course of just this past few years. And uh, it, it, it's, you, you get different answers from people in different constituencies as well. Now, I, I can speak mostly to the uh, kind of the experience of bad activism in Canada, which uh, I think in large part has evolved in very dramatic fashion through the kinds of alliances that people have been building up in reaction to, in reaction to reaction. You know, there's been like so much um, oppression coming from, you know, from the other side. Um, and there has been so much divisive politics that has tended to drive people apart through, you know, through the dark years of the, of the, kind of the biogenetic paradigms reign through, you know, in, in the latter part of the 20th century. And those, those splits between you know, those who self-identified as consumers, for example, and those who self-identified as survivors were really profound to the point where people we're not uh, connecting, we're not kind of developing any kind of strategic alliances. And I think that the you know, people are coming to reconcile their differences in ways that are you know, allowing them to work together. But I think too, it's, it's, you know, that this biogenetic paradigm is, is really crumbling. I think in, in some respects we are kind of dealing, I, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a paradigm revolution. But uh, we seem to have transcended the phase during which any kind of um, discourse that was oppositional to biogenetic psychiatry was, you know, by virtue of its opposition, being marginalized. And that's no longer happening. Uh, I think Mary Anna. I can't remember who. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, um, I mean, I think. Uh, what many of us find really interesting about what you're doing is the stuff that was sort of compressed in the last few minutes because I think the sort of contestation of authority in terms of, you know, mental health issues or whatever, sort of who gets to, you know, provide services to, you know, prisoners, for instance, is it, you know, psychiatrist X or is it therapist, feminist therapist Y? I mean, I think this contestation is, is, you know, really interesting. And what then I was thinking about is sort of your introductory um, overview, Bob, because, I mean, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was this whole feminist paradigm that believed that women's deviance has been medicalized, whereas men's deviance, you know, they've been put in prison, whatever, women's deviance has been medicalized. Um, and in fact, that proved to be quite empirically incorrect in a lot of ways, and I think that has to be admitted. So, for instance, Kelly Hannah Moffat's uh, research on the history of uh, uh, women's imprisonment, at least federal women's imprisonment in Canada, showed that it was completely wrong. Like, all of the, you know, British critical feminist criminologists are the same. You know, women's deviance has been medicalized. Well, it was wrong, because there wasn't a psychiatrist to be seen in P4W, even for the women who really could have used something. I mean, maybe not the psychiatry of the 50s, but, but, um, <coughs> but in fact, it was just empirically incorrect. Um, and I think uh, that maybe there were uh, problems, because we, many of us believe that that was a problem, that doctors have too much power and psychiatry has too much power. Well, that was true at one level, but at another level, 
you know, we didn't work to get proper services, different kinds of services available to women, such as women who end up in prison, who do in fact have serious, um, you know, mental health issues that have to be addressed. So I think, I, I guess my plea would be for us who were, you know, I'm sort of of the same generation, right? And I mean, certainly in the late 70s, early 80s, I was just as happy as anyone to jump up and down and say, oh, down with the medicalization of, you know, women's, you know, down with the gender disciplinary effects of psy knowledge as well. We didn't realize then that the neoliberal state would be very happy to get rid of all, you know, psychiatric services mm -hmm. uh, for women or men. And so, in a sense, I think, um, you know, sort of being a bit more auto-critical about our, our sort of denunciations of those days, which I think were to some extent based on a naive idea that the state would always be, you know, sort of, you know, providing psychiatrists and doctors for everything. Well, that, you know, turned out to be wrong. And, and um, you know, I guess my, I, I agree with them in the second half of your paper, but for the first half, I would not want to say Phyllis Chester was right. She wasn't. Uh, she was right about some things, but not globally. Comment? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that's what one of our, you know, one of our, the important findings that comes out of the Metfor's data, which is that there's, you know, the, both men and women are more, were, were marginalized, you know, and so they had actually maybe almost more in common, you know, than than not in common, right? So, uh, and so that, you know, our conclusion was that you did have to, um, you know. Uh, discard the dichotomization that characterized a lot of earlier analysis. But that doesn't mean you have to throw it out. And when we say that we're influenced by Chesler, I mean, retrospectively, we can, you know, well, and not, you know, before today, but, <laughs> you know, but, uh, we, you know, we uh, realized that her analysis didn't really fit. Um, but nonetheless, I don't, know whether we can sort of, like hindsight is, you know, you have 2020 vision, right? So I, I'm not sure we can really go back and blame feminists at the time uh, for not seeing, you know, that this instrumentalist sort oh, of dichotomous. I'm not blaming them, it's that I think we were all complicit in this. I know, but I, but I mean, I... The welfare I, state would only get bigger and more disciplinary and more controlling. We just didn't anticipate what was going to happen. Yeah, and, and... Well, yeah, the unintended consequences. Yeah, and more generally, I mean, Jane Usher has a wonderful chapter in her, you know, 20-year-old book, uh, Women's Madness, where she speaks precisely, you know, to the issue you're raising, Marianna. And, uh, you know, she, I think she's building a kind of a similar argument that, uh, you know, to a large extent, you know, the anti-psychiatry movement then, which was, you know, extraordinarily diverse and often, you know, as we were mentioning in the paper, um, uh, conflictual within itself, um, simply did not kind of pick up, it, you know, it didn't have the, you know, kind of the risk society literature, it didn't have the governance, the governmentality literature to, you know, to, to, to work with, didn't pick up on how much the sci science had, sciences had already transformed themselves even at, you know, during this period. And, you know, that's certainly what we found, you know, 30 years ago in Metforce, that we, we weren't watching, you know, therapy at work. And certainly if you spend time in a psi setting in 2011, you know, you're not observing psych psychiatry, you're not observing therapy. If you go into a prison, as, as, as Danny has, um, it, you know, it's a very different phenomenon. You know, to describe it simply as a moving target, I think, is insufficient. There's far more uh, transpiring here, you know, with respect to the kind of the hybridization of regulatory systems and how psychiatry, you know, to the detriment, and I think to the, you know, opening up contradictions that can be exploited, but to the detriment of the very discourse that it continues to pour out, is, um, is practicing uh, a regulatory um, program that, um, you know, is virtually indistinguishable from the various allies who are, you know, involved okay. in the same project. In the interest of, of the next paper, I just have one final question. Um, thank you very much, Father Murphy. I wanted to ask you a bit about the biogenetic paradigm, which I know very little about in the context of mental health. But what's fascinating and frightening uh, to me is to actually watch how uh, biogenetics has reemerged in the study of 
race, right? So given you know, that there have been decades and decades of research on how race is socially constructed, um, both in the social sciences and humanities and um, in the hard sciences as well, um, it's amazing to actually watch how biogenetics have researched with a certain kind of um, power amongst communities that have been historically marginalized through technologies of medicine and science and mental health. And so I'm thinking about ancestry testing or um, so, you know, all of these ancestry uh, databases that one can go into to see who your ancestors are, um, but also the ways in which testing for sickle cell anemia in African American communities or for diabetes in Aboriginal communities or heart disease among South Asians, and how it's precisely those groups who are um, themselves being enfolded into these longer histories and practices of governance. So that you have, um, you know, African Americans saying that, well, we want to be tested for this, despite all of the, you know, long histories of. Um, of um, our experiences with science and medicine. Um, so I'm wondering if you can maybe just comment on how this is sort of playing out or working in uh, the context of mental health. Powerfully. <laughs> Powerfully, and all I mean, the, the connections that you are making among these uh, spheres of experience, I think, are are you know important to underscore that we're witnessing. Uh, you know, we have been witnessing the uh, you know, the ascendancy of, of biogenetics. I you know in very 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 briefly. You know, and there, there are some interesting critiques that are beginning to emerge on on this front. A book that Robert Whitaker just uh, wrote entitled Anatomy of an, of an Epidemic. It speaks to the, the role of the biogenetic <clears throat> model in um, kind of perpetrating and uh, justifying the use of psychopharmaceuticals. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, the model, certainly when it comes to mental distress and euphoria, <clears throat> mental difference has become so potent that it has kind of permeated public public culture, and you know we we've done conferences on and we use the term madness and we in in the conference titles and so on we have community groups castigating us for speaking about psychiatrized people as if they were anything other than kind of bio you know biogenetically defective or deficient, and so it has spread beyond psychiatry into these other spheres, and I think those are the kind of reverberations that we're witnessing. Okay, well I think we better uh, move yeah. on to the next paper. Thanks a lot, Bob and Dorothy. Yeah.